Hi everyone, my name is Lexis Hansen. I am a software engineer on Team Trailhead. That was really loud, I'm sorry. And today we're gonna to talk about modern JavaScript features that every developer should know. So forward-looking statement, please make your Salesforce purchasing decisions based on products and services that are available in Salesforce today. And today's topics, we're gonna to go through arrow, fun arrow functions, ternaries, let and const versus var, array methods, object methods, rest and spread operators, and some destructuring. If this looks like a lot that we're gonna cover in 20 minutes, it is, I'm well aware. Um, I ask that you bear with me. I'm targeting a slightly more intermediate audience today, but for those of you that are beginners or maybe, maybe you're more expert in other languages, hang in there. We're gonna start in smaller pieces and we'll build complexity from there. And then everything that we're going through today is fully executable code, so I'm gonna give you a link at the end of the talk where you can go through and try out these examples because it's very likely the first time that these things show up, you might not capture them the first time around. Totally expected. The goal today is not to show you every possible modern JavaScript feature. We just don't have the time, unfortunately. But I'm gonna take the time to show you some useful examples and the why behind them. Okay, so just to quickly define what exactly is modern JavaScript, that's usually designated by ES6, or commonly known as ES 2015. That's the year that it was released. And since then, there has been a new release of JavaScript features every year. So you, my lucky friends, get to look forward to new JavaScript every single year. And the standards for release are developed by the TC39 committee. You don't really have to pay much attention to that other than if there's a new feature you're thinking of using and you see these stages pop up somewhere. Stage four means that that feature is spec stable and then you can use it in the next release of JavaScript. You can also do things in what's called your Babel config file and get early access if you want. Just some things to vaguely know about. So we're gonna start simple here, um, talking about arrow functions. On line one, we're looking at just a normal function declaration in JavaScript, okay? But on lines five and nine, we're using arrow functions. Those are identifiable by this fat arrow syntax. That's the equal sign and the side bracket that you see in each of them. And the difference between the two of them, the one on line five, that's using an explicit return, meaning we're explicitly using that return keyword. And we have curly braces to designate our code block. And then below that on line nine, we're doing an implicit return. It's implied that we're returning something here, and we get to drop the return keyword and those curly braces because we're just doing a single expression here. Okay? Um, is anybody unfamiliar with what this is in JavaScript? Okay, totally fine. You don't have to be aware of that today. Um, this is kind of like self in other languages. Arrow functions can often be used in place of regular functions, but one thing to make note of is that arrow functions don't have their own this, and they don't rebind this. So if you, if you use this inside of an arrow function, it's just going to go through its enclosing scopes until it finds a this on a parent or until it reaches a global scope. Um, I'll link you to some modules later where you can learn more about this if you don't know about it, but this is something you can just kind of keep in your mental parking lot related to arrow functions. Okay, ternary operators, just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. We're gonna use ternaries in one or two examples later on in the code. So a ternary operator is very similar to an if statement. It's almost like you're asking a question. You have a condition, and then if the answer to that question is yes, then you return the thing that's immediately following the question mark. If it's false, then you return the thing following the colon. In our code example here, we have const age, that's set to 34. And if we are checking whether age is less than 18 on line two, we know that it's not, therefore we're gonna return $3.50. Make sense? Okay. Moving on to let and const, if you're already developing in JavaScript actively, you're probably using these daily in your code, but let and const are block scoped. They aren't hoisted like var. We're gonna show an example on the next page that kind of shows what that actually means. Sometimes it's hard to know when that can make a difference. And when in doubt, I, I usually say to use const when you're declaring variables. People will have different opinions on this. And use let when you know you want to do a reassignment later on. There is a common, a common misconception about const that it's immutable. It's kind of false. So const can be modified. It just always has to reference the same object or primitive that it was declared with. And just to show you an example of that, on line one we have max fruits, and that's set to four. And that's just a number of primitive value, right? Whereas on line two, we have fruit choices in array. On line eight, if we try to change max fruits and reassign that from four to five, we're gonna get a type error, and we get told that that's not allowed. But on line 12, when we try to push into our fruit choices array and just add something to it, 
That's completely valid JavaScript, and that's totally fine because we're not changing that original reference. It's still the same array, it's just got something else in it. Okay. So I promised you an example of block scope here. In our code example, we have two for loops. They are absolutely identical. The only difference between the two of them is that one is using var and one is using let. This is actually a common interview question, by the way, if you want to make note of it. And inside of our for loops, we are doing some asynchronous work. So we have a promise here. That's another modern JavaScript feature. Um, don't have to pay much attention to that now, but just substitute any async function here. And then we're trying to console log the fruits by the i value at that time, ideally by the index. Okay. However, in our first example, we get some unexpected behavior. We get undefined three times. Why does this happen? Well, it's because as we, by the time that asynchronous work is done completing, that i value is already incremented. And in this case, i is already going to be three. We don't have a third index in our array. It only goes up to zero, one, two. That's why it's undefined. However, in our second example with let, each iteration gets a new lexical scope. And so i keeps context throughout each loop. And we're able to keep track of what that i is for each iteration and get apple, banana, and strawberry, as we expect. Okay, So that's block scope. So we talked about some iterating with for loops. Let's take a look at some common array methods in JavaScript. On your left-hand side is map, filter, and reduce. If you're, again, coding in JavaScript pretty regularly, you might be using these quite commonly. A lot of people will use these methods to almost entirely replace the use of for loops, surprisingly. So that's um, a nice set of methods to resort to. On the right-hand side, I like to talk about find, every, and some, because I would argue they're, they're kind of underrated methods in JavaScript, and they're really handy when they apply to your use case. Another nice thing to know about find, every, and some is that they short circuit as soon as they have all of the information you need. So if you're working with a large data set, that can be something that you can use to your advantage. Um, short circuiting, for instance, let's say we have an array of values from 1 to 10, and we have a function in find where we want to find the first number that is greater than 3. If that array is sorted, right, it's only going to go to, say, the second, the third index, and it's going to not process the rest of the array because it doesn't care about it. Okay. So moving on to object methods. Typically, if you have to do some work on an object or do some changes on it, um, you can use these, one of these three methods to set your object up to create an array from parts of your object and then iterate on it to make some changes. Object.keys, that will create an array of keys from your object. Object.values will create an array of values from your object. And object.entries will create an array of what are called tuples, so just key value pairs for um, each thing in that object. I've marked one and two here since that's what's represented in our code examples. So let's take a look. We have a messages object. And we have error, success, and warn inside of that. Now, if we on line seven call object.keys on messages, we get an array of all of our keys, right? We have error, success, and warn. On line 10, if we call object.values of messages, we get an array of all of our values, all of our phrases that are in there. Now, let's say that our PM came to us with a task to make these messages lowercase because we're yelling at our users and nobody likes to do that not good for a brand. So we're going to go in and tone these messages down. And to do that, we're going to do object.values with messages. Again, right? That's what we just did. And then we can use map to iterate over each of those values and just do a small transform to lowercase them. And as a result, we get our array with our phrases toned down. OK. OK. This is an operator. And it does two things. Rest and spread. So I want to let you all know that the next couple of slides might come off as a little confusing if you've never seen a rest operator and you've never seen a spread operator, because they look similar, but it's up to the context of how they're used to understand the differences between the two. So just go into, it, go into this with that expectation, and you'll be able to enjoy the ride. Um, so rest operators, you can think of them as collecting the remaining values, the rest, into an array or an object. So let's take our blend function here. We are making a smoothie. And whenever we blend something, we always need ice and liquid. And we don't care about whatever else gets thrown in the blender, right? We'll blend it. So we can accept an arbitrary number of remaining arguments to our function. 
And when we call the blend function, we're calling it with ice, milk, that's our liquid, banana, and strawberry. And if we look at the value of the rest inside of our function, we see that it turns that into an array of banana and strawberry. So if we had a whole bunch of arguments appended here, it would collect all of those into an array for us. A more practical example of where you might use this is if you're trying to do a more abstract function and you don't know how many arguments that someone's going to pass in, a REST operator is really handy for that use case. Okay. Spread operators. So I promised you they look very similar. You can think of spread operators as spreading everything out into one array or one object. So a classic example of using a spread operator is to concatenate things together. Okay. In our code example here, we have on line one, we have an array of fruits. And on line two, we have an array of more fruits. And then on line four, we're setting all the fruits equal to the spreading out of fruits and more fruits. So as you can see, it's just those elements all collected into one array. This is very similar um, if you were to use array.push or array.concat. And we're not modifying any of the original arrays here. This is creating an entirely new one. So that's handy. Um, one other thing I'd like to point out is that you can use conditionals when spreading to build your array. So hang in with me here as I go through this. Let's say that we have all of the fruits that we collected, and we have a basket. Okay, so we're taking all the fruits, that's the same array that we had before, we're putting them in the basket. And the second part of our statement, we're seeing the, the three dots. Okay. Inside of the parentheses, we saw this before, this is a ternary operator, so this is our conditional. And we're checking whether there's room left in the basket. Okay. Room left is set to false, which means that we're not going to be able to add our veggies in. Instead, this ternary is going to return an empty array. And when you spread out an empty array, there's, there's nothing in it. There are no elements. And so this ultimately just resolves to our basket has all the fruits in it and nothing else. So line four in the second example matches line five in the first example. So destructuring, if you haven't heard this before, or you're not from computer science, it's just extracting values from data stored in objects and arrays and then storing them in variables. So let's take a look at the code example. We have an object called sales. Okay. And on line three, we're doing some destructuring and we're actually doing a, a rest operator here as well. So I'll walk into that. Um, on line three, as after our const declaration, we have some curly braces. So whenever we destructure from an object, we have to use those curly braces. You can destructure from an array as well, which we'll see on the next slide, and you'll see that we're using the square brackets to designate that we're destructuring from an array. When you destructure from objects, you have to match by the key name. So morning here is actually working because we have morning specified in our sales object. If we had called this brunch on line three, it wouldn't work. However, um, following morning, we have this dot, 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 afternoon and evening. This is a rest operator. So you might say, Lexus, there's no afternoon and evening key inside of sales. Why does this work? Well, it's because we're just making a variable now that we've collected the rest of the things. So if we look at line five and line six, morning is going to be 482. So that's just the number value. And then afternoon and evening is going to be collected into an object of the afternoon and evening sales. So where might this be handy? Especially if you're writing functions, you can actually destructure from arguments. So let's actually turn this into a function, afternoon and evening sales. If we called this function with our sales object, we can destructure directly from these arguments. And what this means is we can actually take parts of our object that we care about and return those values or operate on them without having to mutate our original object. And destructuring arrays, so remember when we were destructuring objects before, we have to match things by the key name. When we're destructuring arrays, we're actually destructuring by the order that they appear in the array, since order is reliable in arrays, right? So on line three, when we are destructuring from an array, again, we have those, those square brackets, and we have first ingredient. That's actually going to correspond to banana because it's the zero if or the first thing in our array. And then again, just to drive this point home about rest operators, if we then do a rest operator with our other ingredients, just like we did in an object, it's just going to collect the rest of those things, put them into an array, and now we have an array that we can use that just has apple and blueberry in it. Okay. 
this is another thing I like to um, point out when talking about destructuring. So for anybody that's had to like swap array elements in another language, usually you have to create a temp variable, and then you have to do two reassignments, and it can, get be, it, it can be cumbersome. It's easy to mess up. So with modern JavaScript, we are able to um, swap values in an array using destructuring. Okay, so this is like a one-liner way that you can do this. Just an example. There's a lot of um, fancy things, but that's one way. And as you can see on line four, when we look at our ingredients, we now have apple, banana, and blueberry instead of blueberry, apple, oh, sorry, banana, apple, blueberry. So I promised you all that I would give you these code examples. So this is going to be in a REPL. They're going to be all commented out. I love seeing all the tones taking photos. Um, so yeah, you can just go in and uncomment each slide section and execute that code and play with it, let these things settle in. And then what's next? There are two modules available on Trailhead related to modern JavaScript. So the first one is going to cover classes and async await syntax, some of the stuff we didn't get to today. And I know the second module also covers this in depth. There's also another talk today at 5 PM. It's a 40-minute talk um, from someone talking about JavaScript as an Apex developer. So if you want that perspective as well, I think that will be a nice compliment to today's session. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much. I'll be off to the side if anyone has any questions. And thank you all for joining me today.